Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Grey Refuel, where we cap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and this is the 21st of June, 2023. Right, everyone, let's get into it. So first up, we have a big announcement from uh, Georgios Konstantinopoulos here, who works at Paradigm, that the Reth execution layer client is now available to download and run on your own machine. Now, this is release version 0.1.0-alpha, so obviously being the first release, it is a very early uh, release that's still in alpha and there's going to be issues with it. There's going to be bugs and all those sorts of things. But this has only been in development for around nine months. So the fact that this has already been kind of um, a productionized here, even though it's in an alpha version, but the fact that it's already live and in the wild for you to play it around with, or for people to play around with is, is pretty amazing. Now, just to recap on what Reth is, it's an execution layer client that's built using Rust. So I'm not sure if any of the other uh, execution layer clients are built using Rust right now. I don't think they are. I think this is the first one uh, built using that. Uh, and uh, Giorgio in this thread details exactly what improvements have been made and basically what the sync times are and stuff like that. So you can see in this in this graphic that the sync time of, uh, to sync the uh, full node, or I, I, actually, I believe this might be an archive node. It, it looks like a size of an archive node. Yeah, so... I think this is uh, this is potentially an archive node here. Will only take you 50 hours and what and only take 1.92 terabytes of SSD space here. Uh, so yeah, you can see here, uh, Reth is a performant Ethereum archive node. Yes, that's right. It is an archive node first and foremost. So this is actually really impressive. 50 hours sync time for an archive node with less than two terabytes on disk. And you can see that they've compared it here to other clients, Aragon around five days, 2.2 terabytes on disk, and Geth and Nethermind just over a month and over 14 terabytes on disk. Now, it is worth keeping in mind that Geth and Nethermind are definitely not focused on archive nodes. They're not optimizing for that. They're definitely optimizing for just being are the most resilient uh, and, and kind of uh, safe to use execution layer clients, whereas Aragon is optimizing for archive node. Uh, so uh, they obviously have a roadmap, roadmap that I've gone through before that, uh, that a lot of improvements are coming to, but they are beat right now by Reth at 50 hours. And actually... <laughs> It's a little bit annoying because uh, the Reth's uh, time to sync is measured in hours, whereas the rest of them are measured in like days or months. If you convert Reth to, to days, I mean, 48 hours is two days and then two hours, whatever that is. So it's around two days, Aragon's five days. So it's not, you know, it's not that much longer, but for Aragon, but it's still a very impressive showing from uh, from uh, Reth here. Uh, so, so yeah, if you want, you can go download the client and actually run it for yourself right now. Uh, I believe the the uh, links are in this Twitter thread here. There was also a tweet from the Ethereum on ARM account. They've got a package up and running for Reth that you can download and, and start running it there. I'm planning to run it. It's probably going to be a weekend project for me. Get some new hardware spun up. I don't know what I'm going to run it on yet. I've got a bunch of uh, disparate hardware all around me that I can I can just shove into like a computer case and get running. But I feel like I want to try running it on a Rock 5B board uh, and, and do the full archive archive sync on there to see uh, how well it runs and then just let it run to see if I run into any issues with it. So that's a weekend project for me, but great to see another execution layer client joining the fray here. I mean, this brings us up to, I mean, I was going to talk about client diversity in a sec, but this brings us up to basically, I think five or six execution layer clients now, uh, uh, which is which is awesome. Obviously, there are about, I think, six consensus layer clients right now. Uh, or, uh, yeah, no, there's five. I think there's a sixth one somewhere, but no one really uses it. So there's about five there. Um, and I think there's about five or six execution layer clients. So we're pretty much on a, a parity there uh, in terms of the um, client availability, but very cool to see this. Now, one thing that I found was funny about the, the naming here is that uh, Reth and RETH, people are going to get confused with. So I wonder if uh, this client name is going to be changed from Reth to something else uh, because RETH obviously came first and has been around for a very long time. But uh, it's funny how people differentiate between the two. Uh, with RETH, it's little uh, or small case R, lowercase R, uh, and then um, uppercase E, T, H. Uh, whereas with Reth, it's uppercase R and then lowercase E, T, H here. Yeah, so... I guess not a big deal, but something that uh, that I found uh, quite amusing there. But yeah, anyway, you can check out Georgios' tweet thread. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. All right, so I said I want to talk about client diversity. Well, the client diversity on the execution layer side of things has improved drastically recently. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was uh, Rockapool's client diversity. So I, I remember going over this site called rplclientdiversity.com uh, that, uh, that basically shows obviously the state of client diversity 
on uh, within the rocket pool uh, ecosystem here. Uh, and uh, S- uh, I don't know how to say this name. I'm gonna I'm gonna mispronounce this uh, this name here again. But the Twitter account S H F Rin. So uh, basically shared this screenshot of the website of uh, looking at rocket pools execution layer client diversity uh, before the initiative to to uh, obviously improve the the client diversity was was started. So you can see here before the initiative was started, Geth was around 51%, uh, and Nethermind was at 16.2, Besu at 8, and Unknown at 24. Now, uh, after the initiative, a Geth is below 50% at 48%, Nethermind is up at 18.4%, and Besu is at 7.7%, and Unknown is slightly up at 25.9% there. Uh, now, if, we, if you go to the website, you can see the live numbers here. Uh, and uh, well, not live numbers, but like you can see when it's been accurate by. So it's accurate as at June twentieth, which I mean is is yesterday. So it's it's pretty up to date here. Uh, but Rockapool's, uh, I guess, um, uh, Rockapool's uh, client diversity improvement here isn't the only story because network wide client diversity is greatly improving on the execution layer side of things. Now, do keep in mind that. No, none of the data we have around client diversity is ever going to be, or client distribution, I should I should say, is never going to be 100% accurate. There are different ways of measuring this. You can never get a whole picture of the whole network, uh, and you can never get a 100% accurate picture. And there are some websites uh, that track uh, self-reported data. I believe there's one that tracks self-reported data and they've only got like 48% coverage or something. So they're missing, you know, about half of the network in their coverage. So there's going to be different things here and different numbers floating around. Uh, But I think that when you look at the overall trend, what you want to see is for now, obviously Geth being the majority, you want to see their share coming down across all of the different websites that track this stuff. Now, one of my favorite websites is clientdiversity.org. Even if the data isn't 100% accurate, it has been showing that Geth has been coming down over time here. So Geth is actually almost below 50% now. It's at 51.82%. Nethermind is almost at 25%. Besu up to 13.3%. And Aragon almost 10% here uh, with others at 0.13%. Now, the others, I don't know if it includes Reth. I don't think it would because Reth just came out. Uh, but I think there's one other uh, execution layer client. I can't remember the name right now. There is one other one, I believe. Uh, but I just can't remember the name. So when Reth goes in there, I'm sure a lot of people are going to be running Reth, actually, especially people who need archive nodes. Um, I think that's going to be really cool to see how that shakes out. But how amazing is it that Geth, you know, I don't know, probably a year ago, it was at like, or maybe over a year ago now, but still, it's at like 90%, I think, of of the execution layer uh, client um, share market share here. Now it's almost under 50%. I've said before that I think if we can get it to under 50%, that is amazing, right? That, you know, obviously over 50% and over 66%, is, is critical, but under 50%, I think it, we should pat ourselves on the back for that. We obviously shouldn't settle for that, but we should be really proud of what we've achieved in the community when it comes to that. Now, in saying that, uh, the rest of the distribution here is also very healthy. So Nethermind, Besu, and Aragon are looking like actually really healthy. It's actually looking healthier potentially than the consensus layer side of things if Aragon keeps coming down and these other ones keep growing at a at a steady rate here. So I'm curious to see how that'll play out. But yeah, it's just great that we're well below the critical threshold of 66%. So if this is at all accurate, even if this is off by like 10%, let's just say Geth is actually at 62%, not 51.82%, right? Even in that world, if there was a major bug in Geth, it would obviously be disruptive, but it wouldn't mean that the chain would finalize on the bugged chain because Geth doesn't account for the, the super majority of the 66%. So that in of itself is a huge achievement, even accounting for uh, measurement errors and everything like that. But obviously, we the lower we get it, the harder it is to get back up to 66%. So we want to keep pushing there. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm still running Geth on one of my boxes, I believe. Um, the, the, the other ones, so oh, actually, I'm, I'm, I, I might be running it on two because I know my uh, archive node is running Geth. I might actually switch that to Reth, but I'm a bit hesitant too because I rely on that archive node for the Rockapool Odell uh, tree generation thing. So I don't want to kind of mess with that while I've got a good thing going there. But uh, but generally, I mean, I run Nethermind on my, my solo staking box. I run 
uh, it also on my um, my retirement box. But I do believe that I run uh, I run Geth uh, on my archive node box. Yeah, I, I mean I do run Geth on my archive node box. And hopefully I can change that to to Reth eventually and get totally off Geth. But at this stage, it's not like an urgent thing, right? And I think we've done really well when it comes to client diversity. But yeah. Anyway, uh, moving on from that onto the next thing. So Avado had an update today. Uh, they started off this tweet thread by saying, "Exciting news! Avado has taken a major leap in improving home staking by integrating Obel." an innovative solution for distributed Ethereum validation. This is a significant milestone marking a new era of decentralization, security, and participation in Ethereum. So you guys all know about Obel, uh, Obel Network or the Obel Protocol. I've talked about uh, them uh, before on the refuel a bunch of times. Basically a provider of distributed validator technology, which allows uh, you to set up redundancy, make your setup, make your staking setup more secure. And it's not limited to just like staking pools or anything like that. It works just as well with, uh, with uh, anyone, right? With solo stakers, it's going to be integrated with Rocket Pool, I believe, as well. Uh, I, I, at some point, I think so. Yeah, it's it is definitely a significant upgrade uh, for the Ethereum staking stack here, and it's great to see that Avado has integrated it uh, with their uh, with their kind of stack here, which is obviously going to be very helpful for people who run the Avado software. Um, and Avado machines because they'll be able to plug and play with Obel. They won't have to do anything uh, kind of complex there. And in saying that, setting up an Obel cluster is actually pretty straightforward. I mean, you guys know I've done it. Um, and, I, and I'm running it right now, and I've done it in like an alpha capacity, and obviously it's going to get even better over time, but it really wasn't difficult. The bit, the most difficulties I had with, with it was just my firewall was not playing nice for some reason. I eventually fixed it, uh, but it was definitely not playing nice, And but that was that was specific to my box and specific to my setup that had nothing to do with Obel's software, which, uh, which, which runs perfectly and was very easy to set up and didn't really require any hand-holding it or anything like that, which is exactly what you want to be seeing from uh, a, a software like this. I mean, MEV Boost is the same, right, where it's very easy to enable MEV Boost on your um, on your validator. You know, if you're doing it all manually, it's, it's not hard. Obviously, it requires knowledge of command line and things like that, but it is not harder and it is not more complex than just setting up a solo staking node to begin with. And obviously MEV Boost is also integrated with these solutions like DAP Node and Avado. So it's all well and good there as well. But yeah, great to see that Obel has integrated or that Avado has integrated Obel uh, into their stack here. All right, moving on. Uh, Swell has a new uh, dashboard here, the new uh, SWE portfolio uh, kind of page. So you can go to app.swellnetwork.io slash portfolio and track your uh, SWE holdings, see recent transactions, and monitor the SWE to ETH exchange rate all from within the Swell app. So I haven't got a wallet connected here. Uh, maybe if I connect my MetaMask wallet, uh, if this is, yeah, my sassel.eth, it'll show me stuff. I haven't, haven't actually got any SWETH on sassel.eth, but yeah, as, as you can see here, it shows you your holdings, the exchange rate, uh, the exchange rate over time, your transaction history. And then if you want to, you can click on stake up here and, and get started staking straight away. So, I mean, I have 17 ETH on my sassel.eth. So if I go you know, one, I'll receive this much SWE, and then I can stake it there. And then with the Voyage, uh, I, I can participate in the future airdrop here as well and, and see all the relevant details here, which is really, really cool to see. And, you know, it's been great to see the growth of Swell recently. I mean, disclosure, I am an uh, investor and advisor in, in to Swell, but why it's been great to see is because I've been banging on about with us needing more competitors in the liquid staking space uh, and Swell, and, and not just more competitors, but more competitors that are actually serious about growing their market share and Swell uh, is doing very well. Their growth has been very great, uh, very good. Obviously, I'm aware that they have a, uh, an airdrop that that is coming in the future and they're obviously actively talking about that and actively incentivizing it with things like the Swell Voyage. Uh, but but generally, I think that's the way to do it, right? At the end of the day, um, with, uh, with Lido, they actually used their token to grow their market share as well because they incentivized uh, liquidity pairs on things like uh, a curve with LDO tokens. And then the same, as uh, a similar thing for Rocket Pool where they incentivize node operators by paying out RPL tokens. So there's nothing wrong with token incentives at the end of the day, especially because your competitors are gonna do it anyway. So I, I've seen some people say, oh, you know, people are just doing this because of the airdrop uh, farming or wanting the airdrop. I'm like, yeah, okay, we can recognize that, but we can also recognize that it's a necessary evil. It's not, and and, and I wouldn't, I, I would even say that it depends on the way the airdrop and liquidity mining is being done, uh, that it's 
it's not even an evil. It's just like the necessary way these systems function. It's a crypto economic system. It's all incentives at the end of the day. So when you look at these things, especially when you look at projects that uh, are trying to take market share away or gain market share against big incumbents, I mean, what you're going to do really is you're going to uh, uh, use those eco economic incentives to do that. You are more incentivized to, to do that. So yeah, just just very cool to see this. Very cool to see this, uh, obviously this new dashboard here. So uh, Swell Stakers can, can track everything here. And you can go check this out for yourself. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. All right, last up here, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to the ETH Staker staking FAQ. I've talked about this before, but this staking FAQ kind of documentation website here has everything you need to know about Ethereum staking. It is probably the best, I guess, uh, staking uh, information hub that I have ever come across, to be honest. And there are different staking information hubs out there. Obviously, the Ethereum.org website has a section for it, but the ETH Staker, uh, sec uh, the ETH Staker website here it ha is very comprehensive. There are a lot of answers to a lot of questions on here. And the reason why I'm talking about it again is because Iridian uh, here shared today that the if you want to know why the, uh, the initial limit was put on, um, on validators to have 32 ETH as like the max effective balance, uh, you can actually click on this link, which I'll link in the YouTube description below. And there is actually a question here that uh, why the 32 ETH maximum, right? And it, and and the explanations here. Yeah, it's only three paragraphs, but uh, you can see each 32 ETH deposit activates one set of validator keys. These keys are used to sign off on the state of the network. The lower the ETH requirement, the more resulting signatures must be saved by the network. 32 ETH was chosen as the balance between enabling as many people as possible to stake without inherit, inhibiting decentralization by blurting the size of each block with signatures. So that was why the minimum was chosen. Um, to, but limiting the maximum to 32 ETH per validator encourages decentralization of power as it prevents uh, any single validator from having an excessively large vote on the state of the chain. It also limits the amount of ETH that can be exited from staking it at a given time as the number of validator um, the validators that can exit in a given time period is limited. This helps protect the network against certain attacks. The, and on top of this as well, there is also the design around this was based on the original roadmap of, of sharding with execution sharding. Now that that's been kind of scrapped in favor of uh, data sharding or, or dank sharding, the requirement isn't really needed anymore. And I actually was speaking to a few people about this since yesterday's refuel about this proposal to increase the maximum from 32 ETH to 2048 ETH or whatever it was. And you remember yesterday I said that my conclusion was that uh, taking everything, taking all the negatives and positives of the proposal, I came to the conclusion that I uh, that the proposal itself, if it was integrated into the network, would be neutral to positive. Um, and what I mean by that is that like there is a lot of reasons why it would be it, it would be neutral. Uh, most of the reasons are in favor of, be, of it being neutral, where it's not bad, it's not good, you know, it's just neutral for the network. Uh, but why I say slightly positive is because I believe that the big um, win is 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 allowing people like solo stakers and rocket pool node operators to very easily compound their stake and compete with the bigger players on, on that lens and i i do believe it would lead to more people solo staking and staking with with services like rocket pool so that's why i say slightly positive because that is a big win to me i i i weight these positives and negatives against each other and that to me is a huge positive so that's why i'm saying that neutral or positive on it is it worth the amount of work uh to get that into the network and the amount and, and the risk it would it would introduce because obviously it's a it's a major change i don't know to be honest uh honestly we're gonna have to wait and see how that shakes out there uh but yeah i'm, I'm excited to see the discussions around this as as time goes on but anyway you can go check out this east Decker section here i'll link it in the youtube description below all right, so a major announcement out of the Polygon ecosystem today. And I mean, I've been talking about this for quite a while now, and anyone who's listened to the refill for quite a while now will know, but they announced today uh, or uh, a proposal to uh, migrate the Polygon POS chain to a ZK EVM Validium. So this was a long time coming in my mind. I've said time and time again that the POS chain is old technology. It is not something that the Polygon team wants to maintain, and I believe it will be eventually converted into a ZKVM. Now, one thing that I didn't anticipate and that I think is actually a positive for the POS chain is that it is being converted into a ZKEVM Validium, which means that the data uh, will not be posted to Ethereum L1. It will be posted to the existing uh, set of validators that the Polygon POS chain has. So they have around 100 validators right now. I don't know what the... 
uh, what the kind of majority is. I think the majority is, oh, I actually don't know off the top of my head, so I'm not going to even try and guess, but that's the way it would work. The proofs would still be posted to Ethereum L1, but the data would be posted to the Polygon existing Polygon validator sets. Uh, and and uh, that means that it is obviously not a roll-up, right? It is still a layer two in my mind, because as I've said before, there's a dis distinction between roll-ups and layer twos. I think calling a, a Validium or a Volition can be called a layer two, uh, but to be called a, a full roll-up, you need to post your data to, to, the, L to the same um, place that you're posting your proofs to in my in my mind, and obviously in this case, it'd be Ethereum L1. Now, just to recap what a Validium is and, uh, beside, uh, and what the consequences are here, if the data isn't posted to L1 and it's posted to somewhere else and then a user is not able to access that data, effectively, their funds are frozen. So the, the Polygon po uh, POS chain or future ZKV and Validian chain uh, 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 staking uh, nodes or, or validators, I should say, they can't actually take any funds, right? They can't steal any funds or anything like that, but they can withhold the funds uh, by withholding the data, which essentially would freeze the funds. Now, obviously, that's not ideal, right? It's not something that uh, that we should that we should def uh, that we should um, we should accept on on high value chains and things like that and high value applications. But this is where the magic of a hybrid design comes in. Now, I'm not 100% sure if the, the ZKVM Validium is going to be constructed like this, but I think it will be. But essentially what you can do is you can offer the user the choice of where to store their data. So it could be a hybrid approach where essentially that in the normal running case, and if you don't change anything, all the data of your you know relevant transactions, uh, relevant state of your, of your account basically is posted to the Polygon validators. But if you want to pay the extra fee uh, to post it to Ethereum L1, you can. So in that instance, if the Polygon validators were to all go offline and withhold the data, you could still exit that ZK EVM because the bridge obviously is on Ethereum L1 and the data is there as well and you have the proof and you can construct all that together and take all that together and you could exit and you could force exit with your funds and you'd be okay, right? So I think that the, that is a actual awesome approach because it means that the players with a lot of money that you know really would hurt if they lost that money so let's just say it's a market maker and they have tens of millions of dollars on the zkvm validium here they would probably want to post their data to ethereum l1 right they probably wouldn't want to post it to the um the, the, the Polygon validators. And if if the, if the ZKVM Validium here is constructed to allow that, I'm sure that they would ex accept that. But then you'll have other people who are just like, okay, well, I have like 50 to $100 or something and I want to speculate on some meme coins. I'm, I'm talking about like obviously two extremes here, but you can say, you know, people just want to speculate on, on some meme coins and they're on the Polygon ZKVM uh, Validium here and they're not going to care about storing their data on Ethereum L1 because to them, it's like, eh, if I lose a hundred bucks, I lose a hundred bucks, right? So, it really depends on the user, but giving the user the choice and making it easy for them to do this as well. This could be built into the wallet interfaces where it could be it could be really easy, obviously, to integrate this. But giving the user the choice, I think, is critical here. Now, in in saying all of that, in the long term future, if we can scale Ethereum L1 to be uh, so uh, to to have so much avail uh, data availability available on it, that uh, then potentially the uh, ZKVM, uh, Validium, Polygon ZKVM, Validium here could be changed to just always post its data to Ethereum L1 by default if it's cheap enough to do that. Uh, that's an open question, of course, uh, but also uh, they could change who they, uh, uh, where they put the data as well. Maybe they want to put it or a user could maybe put it on like an eigenlayer data availability committee that's using restaked ETH to secure it. So there are, but it would be obviously cheaper than Ethereum L1, but you get the security of restaked ETH um, and with the eigenlayer ecosystem. So there are so many different ways that this can play out, which I think is really cool because it gives the users more agency and choice. And depending on the type of user you are, you can just basically choose uh, your own adventure here. Um, and I also think obviously it's overall bullish because the Polygon POS chain has a lot of activity on it, has a lot of users on it, has a lot of apps deployed to it. And has uh, you know, and by in, 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 and because of that, has a lot of state on it. So the fact that that uh, Polygon is doing this ambitious uh, change from the uh, from uh, the POS chain and converting it to a zk AVM Validium is to be applauded here. And they really did stick to comments that they made years ago. At this point, I remember pointing out to you guys that the co-founders were on Twitter saying that they want to uh, basically. 
change the POS chain to a ZKVM, but obviously they had to build their ZKVM first, which they did, and they had to deploy it, which they did, make sure it all works and everything. And then th this is when they've basically put this proposal forward, being like, okay, we built a ZKVM, we know how, to, how it all works, we know it's, it's um, it, it works. Obviously, we don't know, you know, how secure it is yet because it hasn't been live for that long. But I don't expect. Oh, there actually has been a timeline posted around when this will actually happen. So I think that they're aiming for uh, basically uh, sometime in the first half of next year for the conversion that to take place, which is actually pretty pretty soon, which is really really cool as well there. But. You can read the full tweet and the proposal for yourself. Uh, it's all linked here and I'll link it in the YouTube description below. Uh, but yeah, I think this is really bullish for Polygon. You guys know I'm an advisor to Polygon, just to disclose that again. But uh, honestly, I think they're making all the right moves. And this is just one of four announcements I think they have uh, coming up. Um, I can't remember exactly what the next announcement was for as part of the Polygon 2.0 roadmap. Uh, but keep your eyes on, on that and I'll be sure to, to cover it as well on the refuel here. All right, so there is a due data leaks dashboard here put together by, I believe, uh, Nifty Table here. Uh, who is uh, Coffee uh, on, on Twitter, I believe. And what this shows is basically the adoption of uh, smart contract wallets or account abstraction wallets. Now, uh, I think I've showed this before on the refuel actually recently, but the reason why I'm bringing it up uh, again is because... Um, uh, is because it was updated to show optimism and arbitrum, and I think it was showing. Uh, was it showing optimism and arbitrum? I think it was when I last uh, kind of showed this. But uh, but Coffee basically tweeted this out again and 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 kind of uh, highlighted it for people. So this is something that you can go check out uh, for yourself. I'll link in the YouTube description below. But just figured it was worth putting back on your radar just to monitor smart contract wallet adoption to to see how that all plays out there. All right, so speaking of L2s, Vitalik has posted a new blog post titled Deeper Dive on Cross L2 Reading for Wallets and Other Use Cases. This is a pretty deep dive and a pretty lengthy blog post, but I highly recommend checking it out because Vitalik talks all about how we can do communication. Uh, uh, well, I mean, he sums it up here. He says, this post will focus more directly on the technical aspects of one specific sub problem, how to make it easier to read L1 from L2, L2 from L1, or an L2 from another L2. Now, reading is not, I guess, like cross uh, a chain uh, or interoperability. It's more about reading in the in the context of wallets and and obviously smart contract wallets and things like uh, like this. And and that's why Vitalik uh, says here recommended pre reads. One of them is the free transitions blog post that he posted the other day. But this has a lot to do with with wallets and how they all uh, interact with each other. And how all these, uh, how Ethereum L1 interacts with the different L2s and everything in between. Now, it does get quite technical in the second half of the post, so that might not be interesting to you, but the first half is definitely something that I recommend reading, and I'll link it in the YouTube description below for you to do that. All right, last up, I wanted to uh, go over or expand on a tweet that I put out yesterday. So I said, the foundations for the next bull market are being laid before your very eyes. Are you paying attention, Anon? Now, there are a lot of things to unpack here, but if I go on about it, I, I, it's going to take very long and I haven't got that much time left. So I'm going to just keep it relatively high level. So the foundations that I'm talking about here are not just any one specific category. So you obviously have seen all of the ETF stuff that's been coming out recently and all of the TradFi players getting more involved with crypto and all that sorts of stuff. That is definitely one critically important kind of aspect of, of what I'm talking about here in terms of the foundations being laid, but it is not the, the be all end all. It is not the only thing that's going to take us to the promised land of another bull market, right? There are other things that I've spoken about that are all going to basically make the impact of all of these new players and all of this new money coming in uh, be a hundred times more uh, kind of impactful <laughs> than it otherwise would have. Now, what am I talking about? I'm talking about Ethereum staking uh, as, as a big one, being in a de-risk state, obviously because withdrawals are enabled, there being m many different solutions to stake your ETH, uh, for, especially for bigger players. Uh, the, a lot of these LSTs now getting integrated with different DeFi protocols, and more protocols being spun up all the time to unlock liquidity, to unlock efficiency for these LSTs. That's huge, right? Uh, restaking with Eigenlayer, that's you know being laid right now, went live the other day. So, so th those sorts of things when it comes to Ethereum staking and everything um, going on there, that's a big one. Second one, layer twos. That's absolutely massive. The layer twos are live, they're working, people use them. As I've said before, there are many upgrades coming to 
the layer twos themselves. Then we also have EIP 4844 coming. We have base mainnet going live, uh, which is going to bring on board a lot of Coinbase users, I believe, that have probably never touched a uh, touched anything on chain. So there's all of that uh, coming together there. So th those two are the biggest things, I think staking in L2s uh, within crypto. Outside of crypto, it's obviously a lot of these TradFi institutions coming in and, and ETFs and stuff like that. Uh, but those three put together, I, I reckon that's a pretty big deal, guys. I reckon that's a pretty big deal to bring in a lot of new users, a lot of new capital. It will definitely uh, play a big role in the next bull market. And I think that we can, we can see it playing out uh, next year, uh, as early as next year in terms of getting the, the motions going. Now, I know the price action recently has been pretty positive, especially for BTC, because obviously the ETF uh, news is, is a new narrative. But I would caution against like getting too excited, uh, as I always do, because uh, as I've said before, I think right now the market still pretty much almost all of the participants in the market right now, besides the the long-term investors uh, are traders. I don't think there's really much new money coming in. And I think that traders are obviously taking advantage of a new narrative to trade it. And that's why you're seeing BTC go up, you're seeing ETH BTC go down, um, and uh, you're seeing a bunch of other coins going up as well because traders are trying to play all these different things. But unless there's actually net new money coming in off the back of this, uh, it's probably just gonna sell back down. Now, could it happen this year? You know, could it happen towards the end of the year? Maybe. I'm more, I'm more kind of partial to it happening next year. And and when, when I say next year, I mean like potentially Q2, Q3, probably, maybe not early next year. And what I mean when I say that it happening or the, the beginnings of the bull market happening, it's when we actually break out of these ranges that BTC and ETH are stuck in. Now, I've mentioned before that for ETH, that is at least above 2,500 and staying above there for a little while. Probably over 3K is, is, is more something that I would get way more excited about. Um, I don't know what that number is for BTC right now. I haven't looked at, at BTC's uh, chart in a while, but in terms of ETH, 2,500, 3,000, that's definitely the kind of like early early innings there. Because if we go to 2,500 and then just get sold back down, we're going to hang around in the crab market for a bit, uh, for, for a little while longer. So that's what I'm looking at price-wise. But to get there, all of these foundations that I just mentioned before are exactly what need to be laid, in my opinion. The TradFi stuff, Ethereum staking uh, stuff, getting, you know, obviously more capital into the Ethereum ecosystem, Layer 2s, getting more users on boarded, all that sorts of stuff there. That's some uh, a lot of the foundations that I'm talking about. And there's obviously a lot of other things as well, like uh, smart contract wallets, right? That's a, That's a big one. Uh, uh, different kind of like ways of doing uh, uh, t token liquidity mining and airdrops that's going to bring in new capital. So there, there is like, I mean, I'm not going to say it's, there's an infinite number of things, but there are a lot of things, I think. Uh, and I think that it's just going to keep growing, that number of things there. A lot of obviously use cases are going to keep growing and uh, we're going to lay all these foundations for the next bull market to be a really fun one. But on that note, that's going to be it for today. Thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks everyone.